My name is Perrin Hamel. Uh, I'm a hydrologist at the Natural Capital Project. Uh, and in this video, I'm going to present the uh, invest sediment retention model. So the model is very similar to the nutrient retention model. So if you're familiar with the latter, uh, you may find the concept and approach is very similar. So like most invest models, the sediment retention model can be best described within the ecosystem services framework, supply, service, and value, like at the bottom of the slide here. Starting with the end, the, the value, one can ask what are the benefits of sediment retention. And obviously they are very contextual, but often people are interested in the improvement in water quality to avoid or minimize treatment, avoided dredging in case of a reservoir. So going backwards, the service of interest is water purification, and the service is supplied by the natural vegetation. So depending on their location with regard to to the stream or to main sources of sediment, the natural vegetation is going to retain more sediment. The approach taken in the model has two components. First, the model computes soil loss based on the universal soil loss equation, or USLE. Moving clockwise on this slide, this approach considers the erosivity of the rain, so the, the rain intensity, and the practice and cover factors, uh, which depend on the land use land cover. Then the soil erodibility, so the, the potential for a, a given soil to actually erode with rain. And then the, the slope of the particular area. So in a second step, the model will compute the transport capacity on each cell. So to do this, we first consider the upslope component, which looks at the, the flow or amount of uh, energy available to transport the sediment downstream. And then there's the downslope uh, flow path. So this represents the, the potential for the sediment to be retained before it reaches the stream. So this depends on the distance and slope and retention capacity of the land use land cover on the way to the stream. So for example, if there are more vegetated areas, the more sediment is likely to be trapped um, than in for bare soil, for example. So such a simple representation of the uh, sediment dynamics implies that there are limitations. And the main one, in my view, is that the model only considers a sheet wash erosion. So other sediment sources coming from landslides, uh, mass erosion, uh, are not considered. So if this, these are significant processes uh, in, a, in the landscape, it needs to be taken into account. Second, the model is not a design tool. It's not looking at extreme events, but rather it, it computes long-term annual average sediment loads. And finally, the model requires calibration data uh, to improve quantitative predictions. So this is not unique to the model. There's still, there's still major uh, knowledge gaps in the science. And so this needs to be taken into account when looking at the valuation steps. Moving on to the input. To run the model, uh, the users uh, will need information about climate and soils. So these erosivity and erodibility factors that we've seen before the land use, land cover, and its spatial distribution, the watersheds, so these areas that drain to, to a single point in the landscape, the topography, so the digital elevation model, or, or DEM, and then socioeconomic data to inform the, the valuation step. So with these inputs, the, the model will produce the potential soil loss, or the amount of eroded material in the landscape, the sediment exported and retained uh, on each subwatershed, and then the value of sediment retention, either in terms of uh, avoided treatment or, or dredging. So as a summary, we can go back to the overview slide and see how the sediment retention uh, computed by the biophysical part of the model can be used to inform the service and benefits provided by different parts of the landscape. Uh, so this helps understand how much sediment is retained and where in the landscape, which can be compared with other ecosystem services to inform the decision process.